kids, we're back. Episode 29. Mike Petrella is in the house right now. Mike Petrella and I, this is a very, very unique uh, and fun um, homage because Mike and I have probably, I can't even remember. I think it was the second grade. When did you come to Coolidge? No, I was there first. Miss Berg was uh, was nice. the teacher at Day Rider. So at, at kindergarten in Hawthorne and first grade at Coolidge. All right. So first grade, we weren't in the same class. I don't remember who I had in the first. Actually, I do remember who I had in the first grade. Now that you said it, I didn't have Miss Berg and Day Rider. That was good. Uh, yeah. I had Mrs. Morris. Um, That's great. That was our last year too, right? Or something like that uh many days i don't remember what i ate for breakfast so you're you're asking i have a really good irrelevant memory if it's important i can't remember but if it's something we talk about once every like 15 years i got you all right well the day rider thing i hadn't heard that in a long time miss berg oh i wonder where she is now well the funny part was her last year like two years ago no it was so my my nephew michael michael petrella was in her class during her last year and I was in her class during her first year. So Eddie's the oldest son. Yeah. Um, Coolidge. Both kids go to Coolidge. And he was in her class the last year she taught at Coolidge. And then she retired. Because it had been when was 40 that? years. Uh, let's see. Michael's in fifth grade now. No, shit. Michael, my let's curse. Michael's in sixth grade now. Um, so it must have been five years ago. So she was there a good 38 to 40 years. Wait. Ms. Berg taught in that school from the time we were there until the time his Michael was son there. Son was there. Yep. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know so, that. I didn't realize it until I was like, "That was my teacher." <laughs> I was like, "Did she have the the IROC Z for the full forty years?" I mean, I just heard she was there. I, I never took the time to actually get back, and I I doubt she would remember me. Um, maybe just by name because, you know, like, wait, didn't you I have this? pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, so anyway, this is, this is a really cool episode. The reason why I wanted to bring Mike on. Um, so like I said, Mike and I have remained friends through social media. Mike lives down in Maryland now. Um, and you know, worlds are apart, but we've remained on social media. We've remained friendly and, and spoken and watched families grow and this and that. But one of the things over the last few years, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of time to, to talk about kind of like the journey because your journey runs parallel to mine in sort of the ad game, but on a, in a different side of the ad game. Mm -hmm. So for you, the last call it 20 years, it was, it was like one thing and it was just changing places in that world. Right. Give everybody a little bit of like the history of you, your career, what you've been doing, because then I think it really goes into the world of where you are now and and what the last call it year has been for you so give everybody a little example or a, like a little bit of like where did it start you can go all chunk from the goonies like go back to like you know college sure. graduation leading you up to where <laughs> you were, and then how you are where you are today yeah it was actually before college graduation so um we come from a musical family, you know, Marco is a professional musician. We've been playing music forever, I think. And it's one of the things that I've always kind of held with me. And its relevance is I was walking around campus one day and I had a fish hat on and had a guitar. And I was going to a public speaking class or some marketing class in which you had to give a speech. And my speech was going to be how to tune a guitar. Three minutes, blah, blah, blah. This guy comes up to me. He's like, hey, do you like the band Fish and do you play music? I said, yes. You know, I just started playing guitar at that point. And he's like, you should come jam, blah, blah, blah. So I go to this one guy's house and then there's his roommate sitting on the couch, like playing video games and like programming stuff. I didn't think much of it at that point in time. But as you know, that guy who uh, who stopped me in campus wound up being the drummer in a band that I played with. So it was me, a guitar player that we played in this band. And I got to know his roommate more and more. And his roommate was developing this software where he understood you can, there's a gaming software that you could interact with people. And he started to see the concepts of being able to have a real-time conversion or a real-time tracking in terms of what you do and decided to take that from gaming to advertising. So he and his, so the guy's name was John Ferber. 
his brother Scott Ferber was at uh, Capital One at that point. The two of them over Thanksgiving dinner in 98 decided to start a company. And they wanted to leverage what John knew from a technical standpoint and what Scott could take from the Capital One standpoint, just this business acumen. Uh, so that was November. In January of that year, I showed up to band practice in a suit and tie. I was a British literature major, uh, major with a music minor, which is a completely useless uh, major. You and he looked at me. Dude, like, I was a history major. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's sort of like the, the perfect major for to be a CRO. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, yo, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I had an interview with the FDA. You know, I, I think I'm going to do that. I don't know what my career prospects are. It's like, oh, no, no, stop. My brother and I are starting a company. You should come join. He's like, you seem to be the most responsible out of all of our friends. Like, come join. And I was like, oh, okay. Famous <laughs> last words. Yeah. So that was that was the interview. And so what happened was that, I guess that was February of 99. I was technically an intern and I worked for 25 bucks a day. But what I worked from nine to five and I went to school from six to nine. And I did that for two semesters because my first semester of college was very fun and not necessarily uh, credit worthy. Um, so over that time, like we started and I was the Why, guy. Buddy? Why? <laughs> Just kidding. Well, when you have a 1030 curfew as a senior in high school and then you go to college and you realize you can drink beer at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So um, I found, you know, regardless, we had a lot of fun. I uh, earned a one, one. I did get an A in billiards, bowling and golf. I do remember that one. So that was a uh, pride, but you know, my parents. Um, so it was actually my mother that wanted to kill me. Um, my father gave me the second option to go to school and said, you get below a three oh again, I'll kill you. And I was like, I mean, you know, Sid and my dad were very similar. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. So uh, I, I, I did much better in school, but um. Yeah, I just I started working there and just to understand the the industry. I didn't I knew nothing. I was copy and pasting these emails to say, hey, we can pay you 25 cents cost per click for this, blah, blah, blah. And it was a time where the internet was just starting, right? This was 1999. Um you had the transition of print going to online, pricing was all over the place, money was being thrown everywhere, everyone had a startup. But we used a simple formula of cost per impression, cost per click, or cost per acquisition. And in doing that, we had we can service anybody. And we had this guy who was Scott Ferber's um, professor from Stanford write an algorithm that's called AdLearn, which is an optimization algorithm. It's still used today for the Yahoo DSP. Anyways, case in point, we were one of the startups that did well. We were able to transition during the dot bomb when everything went, I think that was 2000, right? In June of 2000, everything sort of like hit the fan. And we took CPA budgets, meaning cost per acquisition, pay us if we get the intended acquisition and advertisers kind of flocked towards that. We also had to change our name from Technosurf to advertising.com to become more serious and the Technosurf uh, graphic was, uh, we got a cease and desist letter from the Grateful Dead. Um, so, cause it was like a, the skull and bones thing. So like, you know, we became serious. And I remember um, at one point the county came and knocked on the door of a townhouse that we were at. It was like out of a movie, you know, they, they knock on the door, I answer it. There's 10 people working behind me. They're like, you running a business? And I look around, I'm like, no. <laughs> So we got evicted from the townhouse and then we had to move to an office in um, uh, in Baltimore. So that was May of 99. You know, we're growing, we're growing. I finally graduated. And my reward to myself was I just stopped going to school at night, but I kept working during the day. And so I was an account executive. You know, I was in charge of the dishwasher and making iced tea. Um you know, and, and you grow as a company, you bring in more mature people who understand the business. But for me, it was always just... You had that installation of if you're going to do something, do it well, right? And that's oh, that's what I did. No one, you know, I got help. Don't get me wrong, and I got help on what I was doing, but I worked my ass off to get there. Worked my way up to begin managing people. Um, I was given an opportunity to build our West Coast presence, so I literally went to San Francisco every other week for a year, and I traveled between Seattle and uh, Los Angeles. We had no kids at that time, so Michelle was in. Um, I think she was getting her master's for social work. So really busy time, but great experience to build out a team there and manage a team there on the East Coast. And then after that, so that was 2004. 
I was burnt out from the sales thing. You know, I, I wanted to see my wife. I was on a first name basis with the United crew at BWI. Like it was, it was a lot, but it was too much. And I realized that we had no analytical support. The sales team had everything they wanted. <laughs> the inventory team was like the redhead stepchild. They're like, yeah, yeah, we'll give you a desk. And you get a chair too. Maybe figure a it out later. Yeah, exactly. Just get the work done. Okay. And so um, I started the, the analyst function for the supply side and the operations function. And my math is terrible. So, you know, I definitely hired a lot of smart people. I remember I hired this one dude. Um, he went to Princeton, went to med school for three years, decided he wanted to be a doctor, then got a master's in um, science. And I'm interviewing him, looking at his resume. And here I am, like the kid from this, the state school who like, you know, graduated barely. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to teach you anything. But um, he wound up becoming a close friend, like super good guy. Um, we're still in touch. And then the the I hired a woman before who was amazing. And, you know, we're all still friends because we grew up in this, like, we're going to make this department. We're going to do it. And we were just busting our rear ends. You know, we got bought by AOL. We were doing so well that we actually were asked to handle a lot of the operations for the AOL owned and operated stuff in addition to ad.com. We kept acquiring companies. Verizon acquired us in 2015, and I'm still in this operations. And I was integrating companies and just learning on the fly, right? You fake it till you make it. But we had, I don't know, like what we do is not rocket science. Sometimes it's just having good principles and understanding that like you have to have common goals and you have to have alignment. Everyone has to be focused on something. And for me, that was always very easy to understand. Now, doing it was a little more difficult. But... Uh, it was 12 years in operations and it seemed like two days from the very start. And I learned more than anything because I love the grid of operations, right? Like if everything's running smoothly, you're totally invisible. The minute something happens, like your ass is up against the wall. And I don't mind that. Like, I'm like, great, challenge me. I don't really care. Um, so that was fun. But then I was like, I want to get back into sales. And I went and started integrating two companies that we bought, did the account management thing there, worked my way back up to lead an East Coast. And then at the end, I was leading the US and Canada um, for that piece. And that was interesting. If you know me, I'm not, I'm not really that much of an extrovert. I'm not a total introvert, but give me the opportunity. I'll happily sit on the couch and like watch a show and just chill. But I knew... I was always big on relationships, partnerships, you know, I always use that term. And for me, I could form them and find like common grounds. Hey, here's five things we're doing. What are you doing? Okay. You're doing these five things, but only three of them overlap. How can we help each other? And I just learned to build solid relationships. Like I joked that I was 22 for 23 in terms of layoffs at, at Yahoo and all the companies before that. And a lot of that was based on the relationships I made. Right. It wasn't because I'm a genius. It wasn't because like I'm this special person. I had a really strong network internally and I positioned myself to be in a, in a role where I can just be helpful. Right. I don't have much of an ego. I really don't. And I'm all for the better. And if I get to benefit from that, cool. And that's the way I've always operated. Um, and plus living in Maryland, your salaries weren't all that high. I remember one of the most backhanded compliments I got was like, you're not even on the ra radar layoff. You don't make nearly enough. It's like, <laughs> thanks. Thanks. That's awesome. You know, maybe hey, I can so, go. So I have a question. So when you're doing yep. this, because I've, I've sort of come up on both sides too. Like my background is more on the buying side, which is kind of operations because you're not like on the front line, you're kind of taking all the budgets and working them and you know, you're, you're doing your thing. But for me, finding out that like making the move, I think it was in 03 or 04 from the buying side, from being on an agency to going to like FX as a sales planner. Like I found out very quickly, like I was there for probably seven months and I was like, eh, not that I yeah. like, because now that I have my own business, you know, we're coming up on 16 years next month, like in like a week. I'm the sales. Like, I mean, I'm not all the sales, but like my network has been built up. So it was like, but, but I guess my question to you is when you have a sales background and an ops background and you're putting those together and building your network, it's similar to me. I love sales now because it's about building the relationship first. Like when your name is on the company, it has to be about that because ultimately totally. 
I can't run away from it. I was creative enough to to call my, you know, DSM something else, <laughs> you know, like when I started, yeah. like it ultimately blocked <laughs> me. But how did you like know? Because I kind of fell into it. And I like asking these questions. I did it with my buddy Kevin on, on Friday. Mm -hmm. Like you played in the NFL. You were like a, a you were an athlete your whole life. You know, like his dad played in the NFL. His two brothers played in college. He played at Rutgers, played for the Bears, played for the Titans. And now he's the VP. Like he's getting to live his dream out working for a sports marketing firm up here, but being the VP of talent because of all the experiences that he had, like the guys that they're repping, whether it's at the combine or whatever, you know, these guys, these new guys that are going to the NFL, like, the value that Kevin brings to the table isn't because he knows everything, but he's lived all the highs and he's lived all the lows. And that like, that connects you, like that binds you in a way that a lot of others can't. So how yeah. did you know that? Like, how did you know that it was sales or like, like your journey is now on the track of like, you're continuing on in sales. So do you ever see yourself going back to ops or is it like, do you feel like it's a single? I mean, life? my, I was, I, I don't want to say forced. Um, one of the th most difficult things and one of the best lessons that I ever had with what I did is just through attrition. Unfortunately, in our, in that dig digital industry, I will specifically in all the companies that came after that, there was always leadership attrition chain, like constant. I think at one point I had five bosses in two years. Uh -huh. And um, I guess it was six. 15 or 16 is when I got back into sales, new leadership came in and this, this dude, his name is Matt Gillis. I absolutely love him. Um, he's just a smart, happy, like just one of those people that success follows. He came in and he had his folks. He had a folks that he wanted to run ops. He had folks to do this, that. And he kind of, he was like, I want you to do this. And it was a big change for me because every single person that I'd worked with for years was now gone. And I was the one of the few people left of the the old regime. And I remember it was um, he said, "Come do this. I want you to lead this AM team. I want you to integrate them into the company." And I was sitting there. I was like, "All right, here's a crossroads. I don't know if I necessarily want to do this. I still like the people I work with. I'm compensated well, this and that. Or I can go look for another job." And I remember he's like, "You're going to report to this guy named Pat." Uh, Pat McCormick and Pat and I have become really close friends. And I, and I, I think the world of this guy. And I remember the first conversation I had with him was like, all right, Pat, I'm here to help. What do you need? And to this day, he remembers that because when you have a new employee who is essentially displaced, it's the attitude and, and really what that employee brings you versus like, you know, F you, I used to do this, that, like, I know this business, I know the skeletons, or you can be part of it. And I knew that I knew I was an outsider looking in, um, supported, you know what I mean? I, they, everyone was super kind. And like I said, I, I'm still close with Gillis, still close with Pat. They're very, very important figures in my life. Um, but it was upon me to say, okay, this is, this is the opportunity. You can either figure it out or you can go. And I decided to say like, listen, man, how can I help? And I learned the way Gillis worked, I learned the way Pat worked, and it was less about working for them and more about working with them. And they were very open to that because like seniority, whatever, right? Like that level, we were all similar levels. Matt's, you know, a couple levels above me. Um, and, I, and I respected Pat that way too. He's the boss and I need to really begin to, to form new relationships and figure out how to make this work. And if it's not working, then I'll go look. But, you know, change is not a bad thing. And I think people, you know, people typically when new management comes in, it's like, oh, shit, I'm gone soon. <clears throat> I made the best of it. And so I came in. I did my job. I did it well. Um, I helped, you know, kind of drive the business forward. They saw that I was genuinely part of the team, um, that I wanted to be here. And I was rewarded. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Got a cold like three weeks ago. So I have a cough for the next like seven months. Um and I was rewarded for the the, uh, the work that I did. And I, I and I constantly earned what happened. And I'm proud of that because like I was very well supported. I wanted to be part of that team. I showed, you know, that, I, listen, I'm willing to to work within this system. And it wound up being a great thing. Like I, it's, and like Pat elevated as well. And I elevated with Pat. 
you know, and then when Gillis left, it was Pat and I were like, all right, let's do this, you know, and some new leadership came in and we, we continue to just put our heads down and work. And I think that's the thing, like it's, if you're willing to try and you give your best effort, sometimes you're going to be rewarded and sometimes you're not. And you just have to understand if that's like, if that environment is one that's conducive to what you want. Cause like a lot of people are in my position and they bust their rear end, but boss has favorites. Right. And it just doesn't work out that way. I got lucky. I got lucky. You know, I, I busted my ass. I was recognized. I was rewarded and I was given more opportunity and I'm grateful for that. Like, that's just doesn't always happen. So like, thank you to Gillis and Pat for, you know, help me out there. There you go. Thank you, Gillis and Pat right here. Yeah. No, I, 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 I always struggled with this. I mean, in starting my own company, obviously the paths over the last 15, 16 years have been different. But one of the things that, one of the things that I value most, because there's been good days, there's been bad days running this place. And literally like, when I tell you we started it from scratch, like the people that are, you know, following this, you know, this podcast or whatever you want to call it, like know the story. It literally was like out of a front porch, like Jerry Maguire <laughs> style. Instead of a goldfish, it was a laptop. Like totally. there was nothing. There was no relationships. It was just like, you'll laugh about this because I know you understand it. Like it was literally hustling like chocolate, et cetera. And the White Cough florist and Devin jewelry. And it was like, okay. Samantha was like, you have a year. <coughs> Never once being, you know, being like you have a year or else but it was like let's give it a year and see where it goes and it was like from zero i think we started february 7th of 07 i want to say or february 8th from like minute one that first year i think we did like eighty thousand dollars and i was when i tell you literally to the point the reason i'm saying this is because it doesn't matter if it, if you're in your you know your business or 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 my position about putting your head down and doing the work like nothing's going to be given to you um mm -hmm. nothing's going to be you know sometimes the fates are kind and sometimes the fates are cruel you know right. we, we've lost business that had nothing to do with us we had a, we had a client last year doing great work for her. everything's humming along their website hosting company got hacked they lost their website and their backup mm, that stinks ecom how do, you pay, how do you pay your bills? Like, you don't. nothing to do with us. <laughs> you the hosting company. But it was like, Bankrupt, what, maybe. yeah, like, what do you do with that? You know, it's like, you just, you try to be mindful. You try to be empathetic. You try to be understanding. And, you know, if you can be a resource later on, there it is. But it sucked, you know, like having to deal with that. Um, but it's resilience too. What? It's resilience, you know? And I think it's like, yeah. And it's with all parts of life. I mean, work is work. And I get it. Like, work is important, right? Work pays for life. But resilience is character. And resilience is like, dude, I courted my wife for four and a half years. <laughs> four and a half years. And finally, I think she's like, all right, fine. <laughs> like, if you just leave me alone, I'll say yes. <laughs> wow. Right? Like, it's nothing comes easy. And, and I think that's the hard part of just, you have to be willing to, be persistent and take loss and take like experience. I always tell it experience is a wonderful teacher and it has no bias. You know, that's, that's the way I live. I'm like, I'm going to try it. And if it works great. And if not, I'm going to figure out what went wrong. Yeah. And, and sometimes like, and depending on the stakes, obviously you have to make calculated decisions. I'm not going to just go be like, I'm going to start surfing 97 foot waves this week. Like that's a bad idea, <laughs> but like you got to try something. And, and I think that's, I've always, I don't know. I'm grateful for my parents because they instilled that into me. I didn't have, you know, we grew up, dude, I used to get made fun of for wearing soccer cleats to baseball because like we couldn't afford them. But, and, but you just work through it and you just work through these things. And like, you know, I, I remember the baseball team with, with, with Carity's father was the coach, I think. Right. That was one of our better teams that we had. Yeah. And like, we all worked our asses off and we were like this little town and we were playing guys from Hackensack who were just big and throwing balls at our heads and stuff. And, but like, we were the little engines that could, yep. you know, and I, I've always, I've prided myself to that. I, I'm, I'm proud of what we've accomplished in life because a lot of it's been with 
what we did and not what was given to us. You, you know, to your point, like out of a basement and now you're 16 years into, you know, just an agency that's successful. You you look happy, you know, and everyone, when I look at your site and talk to people, everyone's pretty, pretty damn psyched to be working for you and for, you know, your team. So I, I will say that um, it's, it's, it's been a journey. Um, finding the right mix of people has been exceptionally important. And one of the biggest, and I'm sure you can, you know, in your journey, you spoke about it a little bit, finding the right people, finding people that will bring you along, you know, finding people that you brought along, like paying that forward as well, I think is vitally mm -hmm. important. Um, the little engine that could, like we used to joke that we were the bad news bears um, nice. because it was just, that's what it was like. Nobody ever gave us a chance. My boss, when I walked out of the agency, so I made the move from, um, from New York to a, a small, a, well, smaller agency in Paramus there they, at the time they were like 30, $40 million. They were a big New Jersey agency, but mm -hmm. I'll never forget when I said, I want to buy my laptop and I'm going to start my own thing. And the two, one of the two brothers that owned it was like, dude, you'll be back in six months. And I'm like, the hell I will right um you know and that was the impetus to like get it going the beauty of DSM is the conglomeration of its parts so yeah like building a culture it's great I mean now that we're it's a little different now that we're out of the office um I don't even know if I told you we 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 had five years left on our lease and we were able to get out of it uh on Halloween nice. which was epic um, a lot of money saved over the next five years, but we're at a place now where that culture, like we have some people, the beauty of DSM is we got 22 year olds and then we got like 40, late forties and 50 year olds. And so mm -hmm. from the top down, all the forties and 50 year olds are trying to help all the 22 year olds and the 22 year olds. Like, I think sometimes they're like, we really want an office. And I'm, so we're trying to like figure that out now. It's yeah, like it balances. Yeah, like it's a little, <laughs> our creative director is the same way. He, he comes storming into my, and I love him to death. Remy, I love you, pal. And it just like, he'll come in or he came in right when we were leaving. He's like, I don't know how I feel about this. And I'm like, how do you feel about what? Like the the office was empty. There was like four things. Right. He's like, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm like, feel about what? And he's like, I, I'm going to miss you, man. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> dude <laughs> you live in yeah. one, you. i live in like if you want to go to lunch we can go to lunch he's like nah i just love coming down the hall and like sitting down and like watching a soccer game or like talking like giants and packers and like stuff like that. i'm like derek like what you know because the other part of it too is that you got some people that are on the 40 and 50 side that have kids are like get me out of my house man <laughs> <laughs> and my wife it can't wait till i travel more it's yeah. been home for three years. <laughs> it's like it, every day. It, it's it's so there's this like really weird dichotomy going on now of like not that we don't have an identity that we don't have an office, but it's like you know we could go. Our bank is in Ridgewood. We go. Mm -hmm. there, they're like use the conference room whenever you want. It never gets used. So we could like do anything, have right. anything. We have like the best of both worlds or every world right now. And it's like people, we're still trying to figure out like that constant improvement, that constant iteration. Every time you think you have it figured out or something figured out, like four other things go pear-shaped. And so you're it's about adjustment. Like, the, dude, the world in itself, every day is a new freaking adventure for something. You know, <laughs> like I'm, a, I'm at a startup where I didn't actually meet my boss in person until I thought I saw him at the airport on our flight to Brazil. Tell, tell that. me about this, because this is where the next part of like what I want to talk about. So yeah, yeah, just started this new journey. What kicked me off about this was seeing your blog posts about sort of like what what you've been going through the last eight months to a year. How did this all happen? Sure. So um, uh, Yahoo, Verizon sold Yahoo to Apollo uh, and Apollo group is known just to they come in and they have a playbook that they run 
It's all about profitability. It's all about returns. The sale was for five billion. There's multiples expected, and you need to set that set it up to be able to receive those that multiple and be profitable. They had a reorganization. Um, I think there were eight VPs and like five or six senior directors from my group that were out. My name was on that list, uh, and so you know I found out and was got a year. A What's up? Was it a shock or did you guys all kind of know what was happening? Um, we knew something was happening. You know, I think what was, when it hit me was I realized I was in a position where typically I'm asked to make decisions that had, you know, with regards to reorganizations, you yeah, know, yeah. and I wasn't, my, my feedback wasn't being sought and I wasn't making any decisions. Uh, and so, you know, I came to the conclusion that if I'm not making decisions, someone's making them for me. And then um, I found out, you know, I was, I was just, venting one day and i'm like i'm out of here i'm out of here and someone's like don't leave i'm like why <laughs> i was like am i on the list and they're just like mm. i'm like okay and i heard that and i was like i gotta go and that's when it hit me i was just like man you know you knew you knew it was coming but it, but then it, then the news came and i was like wow you know and i i think i wrote about it i went downstairs and you know my wife was sitting here and i was upstairs and like I almost cried, you know, I was just, I had, I think I went through the 12 steps of emotion in like 30 seconds. I was mad. I was sad. I was happy. I was overjoyed like this, you know, I was like, Oh God. Um, and then it settled in and I was like, all right, you know, it's, it happened. It's cool. Like I'm not the first person I'm going to have a year severance. Like, you know, when you're at a company for 23 years, you typically max out every possible severance scenario. Um, and that worked out. And it was funny. I, I think I left it was Tuesday the 18th. I remember this specifically. And I worked harder Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday than I ever had to make sure anyone who was impacted was, was connected, set up, this and that. Like I cared greatly about my team because my team was awesome. I never called it my team. It was always our team. We all played our roles, but I worked with the best people. I love them to this day. Um, and we worked really well together because we all had specific roles. And there was no ego, no politics. And, you know, my directs would have no issue yelling at me whatsoever, um, which was very humbling at times. Um, but like, it was a perfect, perfect thing. Like, I could not ask for a better piece. So finally that week like passed and I, I couldn't slow down. Like I'd never stopped working in 23 years. I just never, never had a break. Like longest vacation was two weeks. We did that once. And like after that, it was like a week at a time here and there. Um, so I, I finally like was like, all right, cool. I got to chill. What do I want to do? Make the list. Go fix the woodshed. Go do the wood pile. Go do this. Like keep myself busy because I don't sit well. Um, and then I think the day after I left, this guy, my boss currently called me. And I'm like, listen, I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm not ready to talk. I, you know, I just, I call, I'll call you in, in a month or two. I'm just not there. And so then starts like the harrowing piece of like trying to find a job, you know, down market, everyone's going back to work. The, the best excuse I ever heard was, well, we're working remotely, but you have to work remote from New York. <laughs> I was like, Why are you going back to the office? No. I'm like, well, they have internet in Maryland. Yeah, but it has to be in New York. I'm like, Thank you. Um, so I started just, looking around and I started making the phone calls and I started talking to this guy. So he was referred, I was referred to him by uh, someone who ran BD and Verizon. She said, keep an eye on this guy. You know, he's someone you may want to work with in the future. So I want to thank, you know, Aaron McPherson for that one. Thank you very much. Aaron, there you go. Um, There's your homage. So, um, so we're, I go through a couple of different interviews. I did the whole Amazon thing. I spent nine hours in Amazon interviews. Um, that is an experience within itself. Uh, and I was told they want me, but not for the job I applied for. And then I can go do this whole thing again. <laughs> it's like, wow. So uh, it's you're like, Amazon, oh, no. Yeah, it's it's an interesting culture. I mean, you have to buy into it. You know, obviously, they're very successful um, for a specific reason. Um, and not to say I'll never work there, um, but, you know, not at this moment and not in the near future, but regardless, I, I digress. Um, I started to take calls and I had a couple opportunities that were with enterprise types um, places, but my wife and I have been dreaming about this beach house 
that we don't own, you know? And financially, we're in a good position where we could take a risk. And so I'm talking to Paul, like Paul Feller, who's my current boss. And he's, you know, just talking about what they're doing, you know, how they need help to grow. And there was an equity component. And we decided that instead of there was one enterprise role that I had looked at and this company. And my wife was like, we've been conservative our whole life. It's like we have the best financial defense in the world. 529s, 401ks, IRAs, you know, any other number and letter combination that you're supposed to do, like totally did it. I've always like risk averse, like, oh man, I don't do this. Like what happens? And I'm like, you know what? So we decided together. We're like, let's do it. You win, we in, we in. Cool. Like I could not have a job. This could go belly up or we are like, it could be a life-changing event. I, hold on. So right there yeah. with that decision, because I find a lot of people, like one of the biggest feedback components that I get with this is like, oh my gosh, like the people you have on, similar to you, they they take these like they jump off the cliff. Like the, mm-hmm. it, there's so many people that are just holding on and waiting. Like for somebody who is so risk averse and doing that now on the other side of it, was that extraordinarily difficult? Or were you guys just like at a place where after you came through being like, oh, you're like, I'm good. Let's go. Let's roll. I was a mess from the time I said yes till I actually started. Cause like, how long was that? Um, probably a month and a half. Wow. You know, there, there was a lot of stuff going on with, they were traveling. <laughs> it was over the summer. So like, it's hard to get anything done over the summer. But you always have the, like that regret. Like, oh my gosh, like what, what if, what if, what if? And that was sort of like the, but we've decided, we, de- we decided to take the risk. So what if should be in the equation, but as a past thought. And, you know, one of the things that I've sort of, when you, when you're part of a very large company, sometimes you lose your voice. Right. Um, and I found that towards the latter part of my time at Yahoo, it's not, my, my voice wasn't as loud because what I was working on wasn't in the, the, wasn't in the, the spotlight, if you will. And my wife was like, you know, you love to build stuff. You know, you love to be loud. Like you can do this here. And like, she's always been my biggest champ, my biggest support. And she's like, just go do it. You know, like we, we have, we have a risk, you know, factor loaded in. If it's, if it doesn't work in a year, it's okay. Like you'll get another job and we'll live. I was like, fine. And so I did it in my first, and I was like, yeah, I was like, you know, it's just, it's one of those, like, I'm just going to go cliff diving. I'm going to jump off the cliff and hope I hit the water, you know? And that's, there was a very similar uh, feeling like, Marco, uh, my cousin Mike, and I did that in Maine one time. We just did a went jump off the sixty foot cliff uh, based on someone's advice. Don't ever do that. It's very stupid. But fortunately, like I was the first one to go, and I was like, you know, and you know, you have trouble when you have time to think on the way down. <laughs> it's like more thought than I wanted, but alas, um, you're still you know, here. Yeah, yeah. I think someone was looking over me <laughs> when we told our parents we did it. Like you fucking idiots, we're like, yeah. Um, so then we jumped again. But uh, not the point. Um, but we did it. And so I remember my first day was I had to go to Brazil. And so I left on a Saturday uh, and and they were very kind. They flew me business class, which is if you've, if you've ever done that, it's one of those things you're like, I'm going to take a picture and remember this. Um, so I fly to Brazil. I meet these guys for the first time. You know, we we I'm just in this another country, completely different industry. And I'm just trying to soak things in. And it's, and it was interesting. I came back and I was like, all right, I'm in, right. Let's figure this out. Let's do it. And it's been six months, I think. Right. I guess since August 6th, give or take, uh, dude, it's been a grind, you know, it is. And it's, there's days that I'm like, yes. And days I'm like, why didn't I take the blue pill? But like, that's the life of a startup, right? It's nothing is, is given to you. Like, you know, um, you have to work for it all. I'm, I'm wearing multiple hats. My voice is being heard. I'm driving strategy, um, making decisions. And I'm doing things that I've never done before. I'm working in a global market, specifically Latin America and EMEA. Um, I get to leverage U.S. contacts and my, my network has been very, very helpful. But I'm also you know, we're looking at telecoms and broadcasters, we're doing things like infrastructure and streaming. So there's a component, like there's an advertising component to it that I'm familiar with. 
but then there's like the SaaS models and, and, and artificial intelligence. And I find myself researching like, okay, you know, what are the, you know, where's AI going and where can we be, where can we be applicable and what do we need to develop and how, how do I, it, it's just things that, you know, I hadn't done. I, I have been doing some capital raises. I was, I met with Blackstone, <laughs> you know, and like I'm in their office and I'm like, okay, this is new, you know, and the CEO and CEO were there, but here I am. And I'm like, Cool. I think the most depressing part was the kids we're meeting with were like 15 years younger and like 10 times richer. And I'm like, mm, you know, but are they as happy though? They looked fairly happy at that point. Um, but I, you know, perhaps, you know, there's always the storefront versus the warehouse. So um, it's been good, man. It's just, it is, uh, it's, it's a grind. Like, and then you've gone through it. You know, I went through it with ad.com and, and it's just Technosurf, whatever we called it. And so there's a lot of things that we're doing that are cool. There's a lot of things that we're doing that need a lot of work. Um, but it's been a really good learning experience, you know, and that's what I'm taking the most from it. And if by chance this works out and it's a life-changing experience and I own a house in Long Beach Island, like awesome, right? That'd be amazing. If it takes a different route and we have to course correct in the future, cool. Now I have global experience doing things that I'd never done before and whatever. I mean, I'm going to give everything I got. Right. This is I'm in control of, of a lot of this. And so the effort that I put in is the result I'm going to get out. What what you Maybe just one to one, but <laughs> well, what what you just said. Um, it's one of the big things that drives me with DSM in that there's never going to be the biggest company. There's never going to be like widening Kennedy. It's never going to be gray. Like, but sure. We're getting opportunities and to a point you just said earlier about the people that are at DSM, that's like the most important thing to me. Um, similar to your wife, Samantha's always been really supportive of me doing this. Um, I've worked very hard at it and I've gone through a lot of highs and a lot of lows and, and a lot of, and I still am like a lot of learning 16 years into it. Like we have this new kid, Jack, who I was kind of like, at a Ramapo, he asked me to kind of mentor him, whatever. It was like during COVID and and he's like, I think I want to start my own agency. I'm like, all right, man, like here's kind of my blueprint. I, it, there's no like one way to do this. There's 50, 50 billion ways. Sure. But within a year, he called me back and he's like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> I'm like, what do you think it was going to be? Uh, <laughs> like, right. you, you know, like everybody sees all the, you know the glamorous stuff and like with an agency like us it's there's not a on a glamour i mean when i worked at in manhattan there's a lot of glamour at like the big companies too you know it's but, but that's what i try to like impress upon people the biggest thing for me that that i value and i think part of my journey a big part of my journey has been understanding what i want because like you think you know when we were young like we were we were, we were like hockey sticking like we went from like one to two to three to five to seven to 22 and then we moved it out of an office that we couldn't sustain anymore right like in franklin lakes you know it was like yeah. an house it was like the best office ever now i wish i had that and then we went to this big corporate office that was 6600 square feet only to find out five years later because of a hundred year global pandemic that we were paying nine thousand dollars a month for something that we used one day a week and right. Pretty know, expensive. Yeah, really, really expensive. <clears throat> but on the other side of it, like, I think the biggest value and what I love about this conversation today, I've learned that the most important thing to me, especially after we had the kids and I can coach football, I can mm -hmm. coach, um, you know, like, you know, I coach football. I mean, that's a big part of who I am and what I do. But like, I'm coaching Lucas rec basketball team. I don't know anything about basketball. I mean, I know stuff about basketball, but like teaching kids. I coached basketball, basketball for 13 years and you see how much I played when I was younger. Yeah. You, YouTube's a great teacher, by the way. Phenomenal yeah. teacher. Phenomenal teacher. I'm just kind of like, don't foul out. Right. <laughs> Throw the ball in the round thing up there. If you can get the ball in there and not foul out, you'll play the whole game. You'll play <laughs> the entire game. Right. Um, but it's afforded me that it's afforded me a lifestyle that, you know, like, could I probably made more if I stayed in this, you know, in Manhattan and doing that? Like, yeah, I would probably would have made more and done all the things. I mean, it's taken me, 
it's taken me 15 years to make the most I've ever made in my career. But along the way, to be able to guide people to your point about having, you know, when you see a post or whatever and like having the uh, from the team, like providing a workspace that people actually enjoy being at. And I'm sure there's hard days like for all of us because we all wear different ads. Yeah. You know, creative is doing one thing. The digital strategy is doing another for me, right. CFO and COO, like leading the team, obviously, is really important to make sure we're 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 providing an environment that's that's suitable. Um, it's been a heck of a journey, and well, I think it's subjective too, though. That that's the thing, I, and I think like that's the piece to your earlier point. You want to coach, and like you you could have stayed in the agency world and worked 20 hours a day and pitched Pepsi in Asia at one o'clock in the morning. And you could probably be sitting on a ton more bank, right? Or, but you're not, you're not there for your kids. Yeah. That's the, like, and, and wealth to me is like, wealth is knowing that my kids know my name. They know that I'm present in their life. My wife knows that her husband is there and plays a part in the marriage versus just you know, and these are extremes where you have like the dad that travels and just makes the money and goes to the country club and whatever. And, or the mom too, like, I don't want to, you know, there's back and forth, right? You have the extremes, but for me, like family, 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 family. Right. And then like, yes, job's important to support the family. And I want to work at that, but like it never takes the place of that. Yeah. And and that that's the, that's my wealth. My wealth is my, my life right now is my wealth. You know, my bank account is great. Don't get me wrong. Could be better. Could be worse. But like the relationship I have with my wife and my kids is invaluable. And I will never, ever put that secondary. Being able to, yeah, um, 100%. Being able, there's two points and then and then we'll close this up. The first, that being able to be home for dinner like I don't travel a lot. Like the majority of our clients were blessed to live in an area where there's tons and tons of business within a hundred miles. Yep. <laughs> COVID, COVID changed that a little bit because I have like buddies with agencies up in New Hampshire, sure. whatever that we've been able to like spread our wings a little bit. But the first 12, 13 years of the company, every business, like we built our, we built our chops on being like a local agency. And that was what really helped us. And the other thing too, to your point about family, and I know you can understand this because we grew up together, like the fact that my dad was kind of always there, it was, it was funny because, you know, whether we were playing football in the back of Coolidge and he would show up with like a box of donuts or something and nobody else's dad was there, like there were, you know, very rarely were any dads around. It was just us right. beating the hell out of each other. Um, but it was like, he now that I'm a dad, it was like, wow, Sibby was right. And I, and when I was a kid, I totally didn't get that. I was like, yeah. why are you here? You're the only dad here. And and now to be able to have those experiences, especially you know that my dad passed away early and all this stuff, like that kind of drives me. Like to be able to. To be able to have a company that, again, tomorrow, who knows? It could all go up in smoke. Sure. I don't know. Um, right. But to be able to have that, to be able to have built that with the help of a ton of people and to be able to share that now and to be able to like now like that I'm going to be 46 next month and going on year you know 20 of working, mm -hmm. now to be able to kind of pass that on uh, to, to other people. It's so, that's the one thing I love the most about. Yeah. It's rewarding, isn't it? It's just yeah, like, right. it feels good because you're passing on good stuff. I mean, dude, I, as you were talking about, I, st I, I have a vivid memory because I think you were beating the crap out of me at that point on the way back from your birthday party in the Intrepid <laughs> in Sid's work vehicle, it's like that minivan that had no seats in the back and we were playing football. It was like me, you, Justin, and someone else playing football on route 17 or something. Oh yeah. <laughs> like getting railed against the freaking wall. I'm like, ah, and they're sitting in front of me like, you guys be careful. Like, thanks hey, man. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't kill yourselves. That it was actually like a, a Ford. It wasn't even because the Aerostar had seats. <laughs> 
it was like the it was like one of those like work vans and i just remember the yeah. inside, one of the best stories from that that inside was the first time i ever gone skiing my parents drove up to um <coughs> what was it we went to bromley uh dorset vermont and we stayed okay. in and my dad i know some of you know my dad others that are watching don't know my dad but my dad was like old school so my dad had a six pack of diet coke that he left in there and it was like minus seven degrees in in dorset vermont and the whole inside of this van like without seat loaded exploded everywhere there was just diet coke icicles hanging like i opened it up there was like <laughs> diet coke icicles all over my skis all over the jackets yeah, like that's the worst that was that was our griswold story um yeah. Tying this all together, tying this all together. Um, what is the biggest, le- like, I love to talk about the biggest lesson, like your takeaway from your work, your family, your kids, the dichotomy of like your relationship with the world. Now that you've been through, like you've been on one side of things, you've been on the other side of things. One thing I love about this interview is, the openness to like new challenges and facing that um, and just going at it head on and being like, all right, let's figure it out. Um, What for you is the one lesson that really ties it all together for you that finds you where you're at now and like really defines Mike Petrella now and where you see him going 10 years into Yeah. I think it, it took, it took a little while to get here quite honestly and, and i think i'm i'm at at peace is not the right term but the biggest lesson that i've learned is just try and be the best mike that you can be and i i've and i say that it, it's general and it's not it's sort of like okay i'm who i am i was five nine at one point in my life and now i'm five seven and a quarter and i'm probably only going to go down from there i am not going to be a professional musician or chef or whatever And those are the negatives, but what I am is I'm a very family oriented, oriented person. I have a great work ethic. I pride myself in relationships, like being, coming to terms with who you are and then understanding that like, there's lots of parts of Mike that are great and there's parts of Mike that need work, right? That fuels me to help drive me forward because it's a, it's, it's a specific course. It's a course that says like, be comfortable with who you are and grow upon the things that make you great and improve upon the things that, that you need to work on. Like my anxiety, I've worked through and it's getting better. Right. So I'm at a great point right now. Hopefully it stays that way. Um, I'm stubborn as all hell. <laughs> it's just the way I am. I'm less stubborn than I used to be, but I'm still stubborn. Um, you know, I, I know that I'm in the digital and ad tech world. It's not that I can't make a career change, but I know that that's something that's going to, that I do well, and I should continue to do that. I know that I'm working to be a girl dad, you know, and I, it, that's, that's, it's interesting and it's fun. And I have two daughters who are awesome. And that's part of my life now. I know that I have a wife who is freaking amazing and she has things she loves. And and so I need to learn to support everything, right? Not that I don't, but just my, the lesson is be the best person you can be, but recognize who you are and just be true to yourself. And I, and, and yes, that's not the most original lesson, but it's taken me probably 44 to 45 years to get to that point to, to identify myself. And really, I think the, um, I think the time between my two jobs was one of the times where I really dug deep and said like, okay, who am I right now? I get to take a step to say, who's what's, what's the next step in my life. And it's not what's the next version of Mike, but it's what's the next step. What's the next adventure that that's going to build to see who Mike is. And that's what I've tried to impart upon my kids, you know, and it's like teaching 15 and 16 year olds um, that, you know, you are who you are because they don't even know who they are yet. And they're not going to discover who they are until they figure out if they want to grow up and become married and have kids and careers and whatever. Like you have to go through those experiences to understand what makes you who you are. And now that I was at a place where I was like, okay, do I want to continue to be me or do I want to try and 
turn up this whole new thing. And I realized like, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with me. Like, I'm not perfect. Like, there's plenty of work. <laughs> there's plenty of work, yeah. but I'm, I'm a good product. And I want to continue to be a good product. And maybe one day I'll be a great product. And, and that's sort of like, that's, that's where I'm at. That's, that's the lesson I'm trying to just keep myself grounded and keep moving forward. So. Wow. Wow. Uh, this was awesome. Um, I, I, it's great reconnecting. Yeah, dude, I've been it's, looking forward to this. Yeah. It's great to be able to share, um, a lot of what you said is a lot of what it's, it's funny. Like you always joke when you're younger, like a midlife crisis. And then it's not like a midlife crisis, but you get to a point where your awareness becomes different is the mm -hmm. best way to say it. And some of the things that were important, like 10, 15 years ago, they're not important anymore. And there's other things that you didn't even think about 10, 15 years ago that become super important. Mm -hmm. And you have to come to grips with like, now that these things are important, whether it be to me or my wife or my kids, how do I manage that and still maintain right. my identity? Um, it's, it's unique. It's fun. Um, this has been awesome. Uh, yeah, dude. I thank you so much for having me. I, you know, we got to get together outside of Loretta's uh, one of those times. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I know well, I'll find you there. <laughs> whenever, whenever, I, well, I do, I have to go down there later on today to get a pair of pants, uh, pants hemmed up. But um, yeah, man, it's like I said, it's busy, but it's not too busy. You come here, you got the basement, you got a fire pit. Um, yeah, I'm, next time I'm up, I'll definitely reach out. We'll get together. I know Eddie and Dirk still hang out all the time. Yeah. You know, so I saw Ed, I, I see Ed. I saw Ed somewhere recently. Michael plays football. You probably saw him on the field at some point. And he plays lacrosse too. So that's where it was. It was at a lacrosse game. Luca just began playing lacrosse last year. It was nice. the White Call Franklin Lakes game uh up yeah. at Polis last year. That's where it was. That's crazy. They put artificial turf on there now, right? It's not just grass. Yep. Yep, artificial turf. Uh, they have artificial <laughs> turf over by Memorial now too. Fancy pants. Yeah. Back when we were younger, it was dirt. Yeah, the field. Well, the field we won our eighth grade Super Bowl on in Franklin Lakes. It was going the other way, but now that's all turf too. That's where we played. Um, nice. But it's it's been awesome. I appreciate yeah, you coming on episode twenty nine in the books, Mike Petrella. Thank you so much. Um, right back at you, buddy. And uh, stay true to yourself, man. Keep going. You're doing a great job. Thank you. You too, bud. Cool. Stay, stay out of trouble. <laughs> Do my best. Okay, wow. All right, see you.